Okay. So it seems like we've got most people. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start introducing the talk as more people join on in. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining this month's Sci Cafe. I know you're usually used to seeing Anita on here, but I'm going to be filling in for her today um, while she's attending the NERS annual meeting. Today, we have two wonderful presenters. First is going to be Apalachicola Bay System Initiative Principal Investigator and FSU Marine Lab Faculty, Dr. Sandra Brooke. Dr. Brooke will be giving an update on the progress of the initiative and their results of the restoration research and experiments thus far. Following will be Devin Resco. He's the Fishery Disaster Relief Program Coordinator with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission. He will give an update on FWC's efforts to restore the oyster bars and revive the fishery for the benefit of the oysters and oyster harvesters. If you do have any questions, please drop them in the question box. Um, Kennedy Hansen today will be taking care of the questions and the tech stuff going on. Um, we will address them after both talks are finished. That way we can get through both presentations. Um, nice and smoothly. And if you have um, a question for a specific um, speaker, please just address their name in with your question. Um, but without further ado, I'll give Sandra the floor. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, I'm Sandra Brooke. I'm a faculty member down at the Marine Lab and I'm the lead PAI on ABSI, the Apalachicola Bay System Initiative. So one of the biggest questions in the, uh, that always comes up is how are the oysters doing? And so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, and then I'm going to talk about our restoration experiments. So this, these are some data that were produced by the agencies that are working in the Bay on uh, restoration efforts that were conducted uh, between the um, fishery, uh, sorry, between the um, fishery disaster in 2013 and the closure in 2020. So uh, the pertinent information here is the number of bags per site and the threshold that needs to be reached before the fishery can open again. So of the 55 sites in total for all of these three agency efforts, uh, only um, three of them have reached that threshold by the end of 2022. So, and those ones are highlighted here. So the Florida DEP Restore Project, which is the panel in the middle, you see on the, the, the right-hand side there, the number of bags per acre that they calculated from their surveys. And there are three sites that reach that threshold. The other panels show FWC uh, monitoring and then Florida DEP NERDA Project, which used fossilized shell and you can see their bags per acre, none of them by the end of 2021, which is the, the most recent data that I have. They've done a sampling since then. There were none of those sites had reached that 400 bags per acre threshold. OK, so um, so this with the, after the, the fishery closed, um, we started to see a little bit of an improvement. And that's what's reflected in the middle panel here which uh, that data was taken at the uh, middle of 2021. So you can see that the parts of the bay are sort of creeping up there, but um, we're certainly not baywide ready to um, declare that everything is back to 400 bags an acre, which is the threshold for fi the fishery. So that's the agency. Now the other thing, uh, agency data, the other thing I like to point out is that the Florida DEP Restore Project used small lime rock for the first time in the bay and that was deployed in 2016. So um, we have the small lime rock, we have the natural reef and then we have uh, the Florida DEP and some of the other projects that use fossilized shell and this will become important later on when I start talking about the data. So ABSI, um, Separate from the agency sampling, we do, uh, we've done three bay-wide uh, tong surveys. So this, very briefly, this is the design. We have uh, an oyster boat, and then we take a sample from the bow, the mid, and the stern on either side of the boat. So six samples per site. And we count the number of uh, spat, the number of adults, market, uh, sorry, spat, seed, adults, and juveniles, 
market and boxes. And we also measure a hundred of those animals so that we get the, the whole uh, sort of demographic. So these are the data from the 2021-22 survey. We do it over the winter, um, that we had 117 sites in the bay. There's that line there that is the equivalent of 400 bags per acre, the threshold for uh, the fishery. So we see that if you look at the market sizes, which is the pink on the left-hand side, you see that little bar there that the, uh, it says 400 bags per acre. There's a couple of sites that are close, but none of those sites back in 2021, 22 had reached that threshold. So this is kind of in line with what the agencies had seen for, for their surveys. So in 2022 to 2023, we monitored 227 sites. And you can see these, these are all the little black dots that you see all over this map. The uh, restore sites that I've been talking about with the lime rock are the green patches. And there are 10 of those scattered throughout the bay. They're a little hard to see because our dots are kind of covering them. Um, those are the restore sites. The uh, NERDA and the career source both used fossilized shell. And the, the career source is the pink. And then the NERDA ones are hard to see. And then the rest of them we're just calling natural reef. Um, so from the baywide monitoring of those 227 sites, um, if the top panel here, it's a little bit differently configured from the other graph, but the top panel here shows that 400 bags an acre line. On the western side of the bay, which is the left-hand side of that pink part of the panel, you can see that there's a one, one site was over. There's a couple that are creeping up on that threshold, but the western side of the bay just isn't doing great. If you look towards the eastern side of the bay, which is on the right-hand side of that panel, you see there are a lot more sites, not all of them by any means, but there are several sites that have crept over that threshold. But the general sort of overview here, or the message here, is that there are some places that are doing okay, but a lot of the bay is still way behind that uh, threshold that FWC put on opening the fishery. So these other panels here represent the seeds and the spat. And again, the eastern side of the bay is doing okay. The western side of the bay, um, not doing so well. So the reason I was uh, telling you about the different types of substrate or material that have been used for restoration is that when we break these data down into different types of substrate, we, we have lime rock, which is the tan circle, shell, which is the gray circle, and then what we're calling natural reef, which is just substrate that we couldn't find any culturing data for, or it was too long ago, or we couldn't find any information about what it was. So we called that natural reef. And you can see that consistently, the lime rock is doing better than either the shell or the natural reef. Um, especially in the eastern, or if you look in the eastern part of the bay, you can see that after the fishery closed in 2020, it jumped up. Um, the number of um, spat and seed and uh, the market jumped up, the seed stayed, uh, stayed stable, sorry. So the market jumped up and then it flattened out, but we're still not very high overall. Those, uh, if you look at the y-axis, that's six um, market-sized oysters per tonglet, which is about half a meter square. So that's about a 12 per meter square. Um, that translates to about 200 bags an acre. So we're not quite there overall. The, there's something strange going on in the western side of the bay because the market number of market oysters is higher, is that increased even though the spat and the seed has decreased. So what this tells us really is that for the ones that get through, the, the survival isn't great, but the ones that get through are making it through to market size. And there's a few sites, very few locations out there that have market sized oysters on them. So I hope that makes sense. That's a lot of information to throw at you. So I'm going to talk now, um, that's the Bay White survey. That's what we see going on in the Bay as a whole. So I'm going to talk now about our restoration um, experiments. So the first one was deployed in the spring of 2021. We used three different materials. Um, the, uh, the small lime rock, which is the same as the Florida DEP Restore, the one I've just talked to you about, the, the little lime rock, it's about two inches long. We used that. 
we used a larger lime rock and we used shell because everybody share, says that shell is the absolute best for oysters and they they love recruiting on it which is true it's that's a natural way that oysters recruit so we used shell and uses two different sizes of lime rock and instead of doing what the previous efforts have done which is put a thin layer of material over a large area we built the reefs up because part of the problem in Apalachicola Bay is that the reefs have been so degraded that we're looking at not a reef system, but uh, it's kind of an impacted shell hash system. So we want to get the, the reefs up off the floor so that the oysters are up in the water column and not going to get buried and, and sloshed around so much. So we had two different sites, uh, one over at Dry Bar and one at Peanut Ridge. And we had five different replicates, each with one of those three treatments. Okay. Now our larger lime rock was between five and seven inches. And the idea there is that if you pile it up, it's more stable and it creates these little uh, nooks and crannies that other animals like to live in. So what we see, we, we went out and sampled in September 2023, this, this year, this is brand new data. We sample every year, and I've shown the other data previously, and this kind of just continues that same trend. What we see is that the large lime rock has more market uh, sized oysters and more seed and not so many spat. Uh, the small lime rock doesn't have very many oyster, uh, market sized oysters, has quite a lot of spat, not so many seed. And the shell is doing better on the spat, but again, we're not seeing those market sized oysters coming through on that other material. Okay, if we take the average shell height that's not broken down by size class, you see that again, the large lime rock, as you would expect from this, this other graph, the large lime rock has a much higher average shell height than the other two materials, followed by small lime rock, followed by shell. Now, even though shell is like, the, as I said, the gold standard for oyster recruitment, it's what they've done through evolutionary time. The shell in the bay right now, if you just put shell down, it gets blown out. There are very strong currents and there's not a lot of structure there to hold the shell in place. So it, it tends to just get blown away. It's not very persistent. So that's our um, 2021 experiment. And based on the results of this, we, we see, okay, the large lime rock is doing better. So for the experiment that we put out in 2023, we use that large, large lime rock again. Um, but again, we wanted to incorporate shell because oysters like setting on shell. So we had another treatment that was lime rock with a with a layer of shell on top. So we'll see if that persists and if it it helps out with the recruitment. And then we um, we used concrete, which is about the same size, a little tiny bit smaller than the lime rock, but still that four to six inch sort of five to seven inch category of concrete. The reason we tried that is because concrete is readily available. You don't have to mine it. Um, you have to clean it and process it before you can use it. But it's all, uh, but it's it's a little bit cheaper than the lime rock is. And then we use the concrete with shell as well. So these reefs were a little bit bigger than the other ones. They're um, which were 30 feet by 30 feet by uh, 18 inches high. These are 50 feet by 26 feet by 15 inches high. So the lime rock and the concrete are 15 inches tall. The lime rock and the concrete with shell had 12 inches of the foundation material and three inches of shell on top. Okay, if that makes sense. So we went out in October and sampled these reefs. And uh, this is just a snapshot uh, showing it was a concrete treatment and it is covered in seed. We were really pleasantly surprised to see how much recruitment and how much that we had and how much it had grown. So these are the data from that experiment. And you can see over here, if you look on the left-hand panel, panel, the shell heights for the concrete, the concrete and shell, the lime rock, the lime rock and shell, are pretty similar apart from this kind of sad little lime rock treatment here that really isn't catching up with the others. And I, I think I, there's a reason for that, and I'll talk about it in a second. But they're all pretty much neck and neck. Um, the other treatments. Um, and the shell height is between a spat, it's, a, it's over spat size, so it's predominantly seed size. So um, if we break it down by size class, again, we have the concrete, concrete shell, lime rock, lime rock shell. 
we see that, uh, again, apart from this lime rock treatment that's not doing as well as the others, that again, most of the spat or the majority of the spat has made it through from the spat size to the seed size. It's jumped up into that seed category. Next step is market. And we have a few tiny little market bars coming through here, you know, maybe between one and four it was per, per treatment. So what I think is going on with the lime rock is that when we first got this material, I had ordered the same material as we had used previously, which is the five to seven inch category, more or less. When it showed up, um, there were some much bigger boulders in it. Um, you know, some, they were, some of them were up to like eight or nine, 10 inches. So they were a bit bigger than what we had planned. Um, we ended up putting those, that material out for the lime rock treatment. And then we decided that it was, we didn't want to continue doing this. And so we switched out the material and the others, the other lime rock that had the shell on top was the regular five to seven inch size. And then the concrete and the concrete and shell were that four to six inch size. So this lime rock treatment had bigger boulders than, or bigger rocks rather, they weren't boulders, it had bigger rocks than the other treatment. So, and what we found was that a lot there, there had been quite a bit of recruitment on it, but there was a lot of mortality. So it may be that there's something going on with those larger rocks where the animals of the oysters are more exposed and they get picked off by predators, but that remains to be seen. We'll see what happens on the next go around, but that wasn't planned, but it was kind of a lesson learned inadvertently. But the other treatments seem to be doing really well. So just in summary, um, the, for the bay-wide surveys, the eastern side of the bay is generally doing better than the west, and we've seen this for a number of years now. Um, the spat seed and market oysters um, are stable or increasing over time in the east, um, but the, um, the spat and seed declined over time in the western part of the bay, but they're, they're some of those uh, ones that survive are creeping through into the market size in some places. The areas cultured with the small lime rock are performing much better than the shell, the fossil shell or natural shell, um, whatever was used for those restoration efforts or in the uncultured areas. But what we're also seeing is that in the more recent surveys that in those areas, the seed oysters are starting to creep in as well. So they are showing some signs of recovery, even though it's really still very slow and very low. Our 2021 restoration experiment showed or confirmed that large lime rock is performing best and that small lime rock is doing a little better than the shell, but by far the large lime rock is, is doing well. And then in 2023, our experiment shows that the treatments are performing equally with the exception of that limestone. And again, I think that's because we didn't use the material that we had wanted to for that particular treatment. And we'll just see how it how it works down the line, see whether that, that treatment can recover. There's a high abundance of spat and seed, and uh, we're starting to see a small number of market oysters on most of those treatments. And if you think about it, um, that's that's it, pretty incredible considering that, that that experiment only went out in May. So you've got May, June, July, August, September, October, six months, six months, and we're starting to see some market sizes come through. So this shows that the, the, this is a very, this system has potential resilience in it. If we can get market sized oysters coming through in six months, then there's at least some hope that the bay can come back. Um, so we'll wait to the end for questions and I'll hand over to Devin, thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Yes, thank you, yes, Sandra. Thank you. Yeah. There we go. Um, am I in presenter mode? Am I good to go? Yes, you're in presenter mode. Your camera's not on, though. There we go. How about now? All good. Perfect. Well, thanks, guys. Um, good afternoon. Um, like was said earlier, my name is Devin Resco. I work for the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, or FWC. I'm in the Division of Marine Fisheries Management here in Tallahassee, Florida. 
And in the division, I am the Fishery Disaster Relief Program Coordinator. So whether it be hurricanes, pandemics, or fishery collapses, um, I kind of handle the bad news um, of the Florida fisheries. So uh, I've been tasked with uh, being the principal investigator, the administrator um, of the program that we currently have helping to restore Apalachicola Bay. There we go. Um, so I'll briefly talk about the uh, project that we have with NIFWIF or our funding partner. Um, so if I say NIFWIF, that is the, Nas uh, the um, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Sorry, I'm having a few technical difficulties. One sec. Let's see, nothing seems to be working. Okay, there we go. Um, sorry, so um, we have the project with NIFWIF. So if I say NIFWIF, that is just our funding partner. Um, we are contracted with them for just a hair over $20 million for this project. Um, briefly put, it is ID number 65905 Appalachicola Bay Oyster Restoration. Uh, but to go a little bit more in depth, um, it's two areas. Um, so obviously with this, uh, talk. I'm going to be talking about the Apalachicola Bay part of the project, but we're also going to be doing some work down in Suwannee Sound. Uh, multiple partnerships. It's not just FWC that is uh, running the show uh, for this project. We have a lot of state universities and other state agencies, as well as public stakeholders. And uh, I think it's important to stress even more the part participation of that final group, the stakeholders. Uh, those whose livelihoods depend on the oyster fishery being sustainable uh, should have a seat at the table for all applicable decision-making processes. Um, so there's really three main objectives with this project. Uh, the first one being baseline data gathering and mapping. The second, oyster reef restoration. And third, develop oyster management plans. So while I'll briefly discuss uh, FW's FWC's objective for the first deliverable and finish my talk talking on the third. Uh, my main focus is going to be on this second objective, the oyster reef restoration. Uh, so for the next few slides, I'll go over FWC's work gathering the baseline data um, on the bay's oysters. Um, the work is primarily um, done by the research branch of FWC or FWRI, Fish and Wildlife Research Institute. Um, and the people that are in the work are in the bay doing the work uh, are housed in the FWRI East Point lab. So those um, lab divers, um, they broke the bay up into three areas, as you see here, for their monitoring efforts. And um, we have scuba divers um, on the water and in the water uh, collecting those data. Uh, that diver that's rolling off the boat now, that's actually me. I was able to get out and, and collect some of that data as well. So the divers take down a PVC square or a quadrat um, into the bay and they collect all of the material that is within that PVC quadrat. Um, on a good day, that's what it looks like. Um, on a bad day, you can't really see too much, uh, but we do get down there, we take a bag of material, um, bring it back up to the boat and really take a look at it. Uh, we also um, take some of the uh, samples back to the lab to do some additional analyses. Uh, we collect data on the sample weight, the number and the size of both live oysters and dead oysters, and also the number of predators that are present um, in our sampled areas. Uh, we also do a lot of uh, mapping work, um, mapping of the hard substrate of the historical areas that could support oysters. It's very important to determine uh, the current status of those reefs, particularly the heights, and how the, they could be um, uh, restored with future restoration efforts. Um, so you don't need to really pay attention to all the captions on this vessel. Um, just know that the vessel had so much high-tech equipment on it, uh, it'd probably make Elon Musk jealous. Um, we were contracted with the University of New Hampshire to do that mapping. Um, they were able to collect 3D mapping of a lot of the reefs in Apalachicola Bay, as well as the bottom profiling. Um, we also had some researchers on another vessel that was tonging uh, the areas that were mapped for ground truthing. And I'll get a little bit more into that um, on the next two slides. So the mapping that the University of New Hampshire was able to do is uh, shown here in this figure. Overall, over 15,000 acres were mapped by our contractors. 
Um, we also took, like I said, a lot of that ground truthing tonging data um, where we were able to show uh, different profiles of the bottom. So that yellow is hard substrate. That is area that would be uh, beneficial for restoration for the oysters. The brown is mud. We really want to stick away from that. Uh, and the green areas that you see over in the east and central east parts of the bay are live oysters. So both sets of mapping data, along with all the data that our researchers were gathering after our diving surveys, really provides FWC with a good starting point to see how restoration efforts uh, would affect the bay's oyster populations. So a lot of that mapping data that we did get um, shows that there's approximately 2,000 acres of potential oyster habitat. Uh, unfortunately, most of that area is degraded and does not support oyster spat settlement, something uh, that uh, Sandra hinted at as well in her presentation. Um, and, and like I mentioned, and like those green dots were showing in the slide before, the east and central east sides of the bay are the main areas that are currently supporting oysters and likely represents the core of the oyster population in the bay today. Uh, it wasn't all negative news, though. Um, that mapping area did show where restoration would be most beneficial. And uh, we were able to, FWC, we're, we're able to uh, secure an additional $10 million allocated from Governor DeSantis's Framework for Freedom budget uh, for oyster reef restoration. 100% of that $10 million is allocated for oyster reef restorations here in Apalachicola Bay. So um, our funding partner, NIFWIF, uh, has requested that we conduct a restoration pilot study prior to the extensive restoration. And ultimately, it's because the past restoration work that's been done in the Bay didn't really perform as well as expected. Um, some of that is uh, very apparent in some of those data um, figures and tables that Sandra was presenting earlier. We didn't really hit our benchmarks, ecologically speaking, that we had hoped. So. Um, NIFWIF wants to be as fiscally responsible as possible, so they are requesting to uh, have a pilot study done to hopefully turn more of those unknowns into knowns prior to doing the extensive restoration. So um, they are the ones with the, uh, the money, so FWC agreed to uh, perform a large-scale pilot study. Um, FWC, or, uh, FSU will be conducting complementary studies, what Sandra mentioned in her presentations, uh, the uh, sampling and the monitoring oversight will be done by our researchers at the East Point Lab. And ultimately, using the studies, both FWC and FSUs, um, will provide FWC with more insight uh, to conduct that larger future restoration in a fiscally responsible manner. So much of the rest of the presentation, I'm going to be talking about this pilot study. So again, this is the same figure that I showed a few slides ago. This is the mapping area that we're uh, performed by our contractors, the University of New Hampshire. And uh, for the restoration pilot study, we're going to be focusing in on this area in the red square. Uh, because again, the east and central east sides of the bay are the main areas that are currently supporting oysters and likely represents the core of the oyster population in the bay. So that's where we want to focus our restoration efforts. And, and I'll hint on that a little bit more in, in the next few slides. So zeroing in on this area, uh, we kind of focus in on, on this little uh, patch in the central east area, the Peanut Ridge, Cat Point Spur, North Platform Reefs. So these four figures and the data that they present, um, all these data were either uh, provided by our mapping contractors or the research branch um, in East Point with FWRI. Uh, so the area here in the upper left is just your natural hard bottom area. That's really kind of the, the baseline that we want to start with when determining where to do the restoration. Uh, this area is side scan sonar area that really shows some of the, uh, the bottom profiles um, of the, uh, the bottom uh, natural hard substrate. This area right here is the bathymetry, so just the depths. And, and finally, the uh, area here is a lot of the data that we were able to get from that brown truth tonguing data. So the, the crosshatched areas are areas where there are current oyster populations today. Well, we know that there are some surviving populations there right now. Doesn't mean that they're market, but there are oysters there. Those yellow dots there are where we tongued. We didn't yield any oysters, but it was hard bottom. So not mud, that's what we were looking for. Uh, and then ultimately, in addition to all this data that we were able to gather, discussions with local stakeholders and other scientific uh, subject matter experts from other state agencies and universities all went together to determine where we should focus this pilot study. 
um, and a culmination of all those data and discussions landed us with these 24 areas. Um, those five characteristics that I have there on the left, all of those are super important for oyster reef restoration. We want hard bottom. You don't want to put all of your rock in mud and just let it sink. We need good water flow. We want it to be nearby oysters. We don't want to dump rock on top of oysters, but we want to go right next door to them. And then for a contractor's perspective, number four and number five, we don't want to create a navigational hazard and we want it to be easily navigable for our contractor. Those 24 red areas that you see on that figure hit all five of those uh, characteristics. So um, we're really uh, happy with the site set that we picked for this pilot study. So some more um, characteristics of our pilot study. Um, so we're going to be testing multiple reef height. Uh, like Sandra mentioned in her presentation, the reefs in Apalachicola Bay are severely degraded. Um, some researchers have said it's as flat as the parking lot out there. That is not good for oyster ecology. So what our study is going to be doing is really moving it up uh, the reefs, the relief of the reefs, much higher than previous studies have done in the past. Uh, the material we're going to be using is the Kentucky Blue Limestone. Uh, it's been used in the bay previously and it's had pretty good results. Um, we're not going to be using large rock uh, that's unable to be tongued. Um, our competitive procurement requested rocks um, anywhere from four to eight inches, um, plus or minus one inch on either side. Our contractor said that they can get within that size. It's going to be a little bit on the smaller side, so maybe three to six, four to six inches. Uh, but a lot of the data from the past has shown that that is a good uh, dimension to move forward with. Uh, so these are some figures of some of the samples that I've got from our contractor. Um, I took these photos yesterday, so you can see it's a little bit darker than some of the material that's been used in the, uh, in the past. Um, I provided some of these samples to some geologists with the Florida Geological Survey. Um, they're the rock experts um, and said, basically, give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Um, they used a lot of terms that I'm unfamiliar with, with shooting it through lasers and taking a look at it under microscopes and all that fun stuff. And they said, yeah, all this will work very well in Apalachicola Bay for oyster restoration. Um, and this is just another photo of uh, showing just the dimensions of it. So it, at first, we were going to use larger rock. Uh, that became cost prohibitive, as well as it wasn't very favorable among stakeholders. We think that we hit a nice uh, Goldilocks zone with this size. It's not too small. It's not too large. We think it'll be beneficial for both the oysters and the oyster harvesters. Um, so some more characteristics. Um, each of those red squares that I showed on those figures a, a little bit ago, um, that's one square acre. So it's a little bit larger uh, than some of the uh, other current um, restoration activities that are currently taking place in the bay. Um, FWC is going to hire a site observer to be on the water watching the contractor do this uh, deployment efforts. Um, we're also going to be mapping the reefs immediately after deployment to make sure that everything is done and is uh, as built uh, per the specifications that we have provided to the contractor. And overall, we are going to exhaust the $10 million that we have allocated from the governor for this study. Um, the next slide will show that we're, we're getting a little bit more bang for a buck than we initially thought, um, but we are going to use all $10 million to put material in the bay for oyster restoration. Um, and then uh, all the work that um, FSU is currently doing is gonna be very beneficial for FWC moving forward. Um, ultimately, it increases the scientific scope of the work that's being done in Appalach and provides more data to assist FWC and any other entity that's going to be taking part in restoration in the future. So like I mentioned, um, we're going to be, be able to do a little bit more um, restoration than we initially thought due to some additional funding allocations. Uh, so these red squares here, um, this is what I've been talking about over the last few slides, the 24 one square acre reefs. Uh, that are going to be receiving uh, the uh, material for our pilot study. We had some additional funding, so we're going to do some additional um, restoration efforts. Uh, so these four reefs uh, below here, um, we're going to be provided to FSU. Um, we are, we want to boost the collaboration between the two entities. Uh, so providing uh, FSU four one square acre reefs to uh, blend some of the research that is ongoing um, will be beneficial um, in the long run for both, both parties. So we're going to provide them with four one square acre reefs. And then ultimately, we just want to get some acreage out there of restoration work. So we talked to, I talked to researchers in um, 
our research branch at East Point, talk to uh, different state agencies and universities, and then talk to, to uh, some of the local stakeholders in Franklin County that said, hey, if we have rock to dump, where should we do it? That's both beneficial for the oysters and the oyster harvesters. These are the two areas that we landed on. So each of those is about uh, anywhere from 30 to 32 square acres um, up north in Cat Point and down south in East Hole. So given our pilot study, red reefs, FSU's teal reefs, and then the blue reefs that you see there, overall, we're gonna uh, be able to restore up to uh, 95 acres of oyster reef habitat. So we're really uh, happy with how this has, has, has turned out. And just for perspective, if not everyone knows what these reefs are um, here, I can try and freehand it. So this is basically the bridge uh, to St. George Island, the Patton Bridge. So everything is gonna be east of that bridge, just provide a little bit more uh, perspective. So um, this is just a quick kind of flow plan that I um, envision for uh, the adaptive management and the restoration of Apalachicola Bay. Um, so we have FSU and FWC here. Um, we're creating or conducting our restoration pilot studies. Uh, we're gonna deploy the material. We're gonna have divers in the water monitoring, surveying it, getting data off of it to see what works, what doesn't work. That's when we're gonna get together. Um, we're going to kind of Frankenstein the best of both uh, entities studies to see again what worked what didn't work to move forward in the uh, the best manner possible that's when we're going to uh, FWC is going to do our large-scale restoration we're going to take all the funding that we have remaining with the NIFWIF project for large-scale extensive oyster reef uh, restoration kind of two things that'll spin off of that the first pros and cons for future restoration activities like I've mentioned some of the past work has not really performed as well as expected, ecologically speaking. Uh, so we're hoping that the pilot studies and the large scale restoration really provides um, FWC with a blueprint moving forward. So when there is additional funding allocated for oyster reef re restoration, we have a good recipe to move forward with. And, and secondly, um, it'll inform FWC on the management options for the local fisheries. So this is a very distilled, um, elementary view that I see as the long-term uh, uh, management and adaptive uh, restoration of Apalachicola Bay. So in, in regards to the oyster fishery itself, uh, FWC continues to gather public feedback to help inform our actions to manage the oyster fishery in Apalachicola Bay. Um, we also continue to monitor and analyze the biological data. Um, like Sandra mentioned, we're starting to see some positive trends in the bay, which we're very uh, excited to see. Um, for some of our work that we've been looking at, um, our recent monitoring efforts have shown um, some significant improvements where restoration has occurred. That fits well with our timeline of our restoration, that the bay seems to be kind of hungry for additional material, additional restoration. So we think the timing is going to work out very well for this pilot study. Ultimately, decisions on future restoration and reopening of the bay will be data informed as well as include public input. Like I mentioned, I always want stakeholders at the table for the decision making process. Any decisions that FWC makes on the management of the Apalachicola Bay oyster uh, fishery is not going to be done in closed doors. Everyone is going to have um, an opportunity to provide their input on what they like and what they don't like moving forward on how the oyster fishery is managed in Appalach. FWC is gonna be doing that by increasing our stakeholder engagement efforts in the coming months. We've been having discussions um, on getting down to Franklin County a little bit more to, uh, again, interact and make sure that the stakeholders are involved in the decision-making process. We're also gonna be leveraging the process of the FSU APSE successor groups, future efforts. Uh, we're very excited to see that um, kind of get off the ground and, and get up and moving. Um, and then ultimately, I think something that everyone can kind of agree with is that the funding that we currently have is not enough. Uh, so FWC is actively researching uh, additional funding opportunities um, to help inform both the restoration and the management of the oyster fishery. So in conclusion, um, FWC currently has $20 million for preliminary data gathering and analyses, restoration efforts, and stakeholder informed regionally specific oyster management plans. Uh, this is for both Apalachicola Bay and Suwannee Sound, but the restoration work 
for both the $20 million and the additional $10 million from the state is 100% for Apalachicola Bay. Um, we are doing this restoration pilot study. We are well underway. Um, we have a contractor ready to go to start cutting rock and really staging the material. It is a lot of material that this contractor has to secure. I think well, ultimately it's gonna be approximately 100,000 uh, tons. So it's a lot of material that we need to get from this contractor. Um, the contractor has said they need basically the rest of this year to prep all of that material. So the material in the bay is going to be begin in uh, early spring, 2024. Um, we're going to be very upfront on when this is going to happen and invite people out onto the water to be able to observe the deployment efforts. Uh, ultimately, this pilot study, uh, we hope, will uh, inform us for the large-scale restoration that will happen uh, shortly after the pilot study. Again, we continually look for additional funding sources. Um, and I always like to end my presentations with this statement that successful Apalachicola Bay oyster restoration will be possible through the culmination of work from management entities, university researchers, and local stakeholders. Um, so that's my contact information. I'm more than happy um, to uh, address um, any questions or inquiries via email um, or over the, uh, the phone. If you guys wanna call me up and talk about what's working, what's not working, I'm always, uh, my email inbox and my phone are always open. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm more than happy to provide it back to folks here and uh, take any questions. Thank you for that, Devin. Um, yes, if anybody has questions, you can click on the questions tab and type it directly into there. Um, or if you feel you have a really long question and you want to come off mute, um, you can raise your hand and we will unmute you. We've got one raised hand from Rebecca Dolan. So hold on, Rebecca, one second, and we'll uh, give you the ability to unmute yourself. All right, you should be free to unmute and ask your question. Okay, hey, thank you. It's not a long question, but it's easier to speak than type. So, so my question is, can you explain uh, again the 400 bag metric that you mentioned at the beginning of the talk for a threshold for reopening the bay, like over what area or how you know how that works. Yeah, Sandra, you, you take that, Devin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you take. So, um, I, I assumed that there may be some questions based on that because um, it's kind of an outdated metric. Um, no one really knows where that came. No one knows how that came about. FDAX came up with that number, but we can't really find out on why they picked that number. I'm not saying that they just threw a dart and they said 400, that sounds good. Um, so it may be an outdated metric. Um, ultimately, what we have seen is 100 bags an acre is a severely depleted habitat. Um, 200, you can potentially see some type of limited reopening and four is sustainable. We're not really sure if that really works for this system or any system. So that's something that um, FWC has really been looking into um, to determine what benchmark do we need to hit to where we can say, yes, we are good to go. We are ready to open. Um, that's going to take a lot of uh, data gathering, data analyses, talking with stakeholders. But ultimately, that's what we've currently been using. But I want to add the caveat that that may be outdated and may be subject to change to make sure that whatever number we do end up using is very reflective of the actual health of the ecosystem. And, and in addition, they, um, you know, 400 bags in one area doesn't mean that the entire bay has 400 bags or whatever that threshold ends up being. The 400 bags is actually written in the um, uh, the legislation for closing and opening the bay it's just mm -hmm. part of that wording um but we're what we're seeing in the bay is patches that are doing well so this is something that fwc are going to have to wrestle with is at what point do you open a fishery do you open it in the patches and if so how much effort because you could deplete it if there's too much effort in the patches so i don't envy them their job it's it's complicated
Thank you for that question, Rebecca. We do have one question here in the chat. Um, it's from Michael Pierce. He wants to know why is the west side of the bay doing so poorly? Um, I think that should be for Sandra. You had the west and east. Yeah. Um, we're not entirely sure. It's probably something to do with the salinity. So the biggest exchange of water in the bay comes through West Pass, which goes right over Dry Bar. I mean, Apalachicola Bay is kind of like a washing machine. It comes flying in and then it flies back out again. Strong currents, lots of lots of movement. If you look back over time to some of the, there's this beautiful old map from 1860. And it shows that Dry Bar, the, the reefs on Dry Bar were like a string of pearls that sort of went down the backbone on the west side of Dry Bar. And those reefs are no longer there. So it's possible that given that, you know, that area has probably always been sailing just because of the water coming through West Pass. And it's possible that, that those intertidal reefs, they're emergent at low tide, they give the oysters some refuge from predation. We think this is kind of kind of what's happening. The short answer is we don't know. Um, but so, and the restoration that's been done on um, the western side of the bay really hasn't worked. And so, one idea is that maybe if we we being the royal we somebody rebuilds those reefs up to where they were historically we may change the hydrodynamics and change the sort of the ecology of that area and put it back to the way it used to be, we may start seeing the oysters coming back again. But in answer to your question, it's probably a function of the salinity. Um, but it, it, no doubt, it's biology. It's probably more complicated than that. It's not a very satisfying answer, I'm afraid. <laughs> it's a little bit more complicated than we don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then we have another we have hand, hand raised, Kennedy. Yes, for Heather Rash. I'm unmuting you, and you should be able to unmute yourself now, Heather. In the meantime, we had another question come in the chat, uh, the questions box from Candy Mixon. Uh, from one of the data in Sandra's presentation, Okay, yes, Heather, go ahead. Yep, I'm sorry, this is Steve actually. And um, my All question right, was with the 95 acres of experimental reefs between FSU and FWC, what, what's the timeline on coming to some conclusions or when, you know, when, when will decisions be made? Yeah, so um, we, again, we're planning on having the deployment uh, of those 95 acres done um, or starting in the spring. It's obviously weather dependent, hurricane season, all that fun stuff. But um, we've been told that the contractor that this is the primary work that this person is going to be doing. So we anticipate um, them getting that done pretty quick in the spring. Uh, ultimately, our researchers are ready to go to start collecting those data. Um, they've been told, not told, they've told us 12 to 18 months worth of data gathering. We're going to push them on that if we're starting to see some positive results, both from our pilot study, as well as all the other studies that have been going on, we think we can move up the timeline to be able to get um, a contractor um, by late uh, 2024, um, well, that'd probably be the best case scenario, to use the rest of the NIFWIF funding for restoration purposes. Um, ultimately, within the timeline of the fishery being closed, that would provide uh, about a year's worth uh, of soaking uh, of that material until January 1, 2026. I can't comment on will the entire bay be opened, will only portions of it. That's something that we're going to have to, you know, have talks with stakeholders, have internal talks. Um, I'm very low on the FWC totem pole to be making uh, those type of very large comments. Uh, but uh, again, I will say that stakeholders are going to be involved in that process. But uh, in regards to the timeline, we know it's quick, um, but we're starting to see good data. Um, ultimately, with most of my work, I'm a glass half empty kind of guy. But for this, um, I, I think it's the opposite. That I feel pretty confident that uh, we're going to be able to get some good data, some meaningful restoration, and some good involvement 
and discussions with stakeholders. Um, I don't know if everyone's going to get everything they want in regards to January 1, 2026, how that looks, uh, but I think we're going to be able to do it in the best manner uh, for the long-term fishery as well as the long-term benefit of the oysters themselves. Thank you. Okay, the other question from Candy Mixon or Sandra was, how do you interpret the SPAT when adult numbers are declining, but the market is going up? Um, if you want to, Sandra, I'll make you the presenter again if you want to reshare one of those slides if you if you're interested. Um, I, I can if you want, but um, but I can just address that. It's it's a bit confusing because the the bars on the well, all right, essentially, if you look at the maybe I should pull it up, but the y bars were different. So you can you can have a if you have a, an awful lot of spat in the system and then, yeah, it'd probably be easier if I share. Okay, let me see. I don't know where it's gone. I've lost my presentation. There it is. All right. Can you see that? Oh, wait. Can you see that? See my screen? Okay. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I think it's this one you're talking about. Um, so if you look at the the y axis here, um, it's, yeah, it's actually not. <laughs> so this is, if you think about the, uh, say it takes a year for the SPAC to come through to market size. All right, so in 2022-23, we see that jump up, but those will be SPAT that was set probably the year before. So that, if you go back to 2021-22, you can see that the, the SPAT number, even though it was going down, it was still quite high, relatively speaking. So, but the, yeah, it, our best explanation is that there are a few spots out there where the numbers are there's enough market size or enough seed surviving to market size and they're they're persisting that they're showing up at certain sites and if you look at the variance you see these error bars in that um if you look at the bottom where it says market you can see that even though the the average the dot is up there there's a lot of error in that so that means that some of the sites are doing really well and some of them are doing really poorly. So it's not a good explanation and we are scratching our heads over it as well, um, honestly. Um, and I'm also a little bit disappointed that the market sized oysters in the eastern part of the bay aren't also increasing uh, or they're then rather than not increasing. The trend that we're hoping to see is a one of increasing well spat you know that's you can't really judge how many adults you're going to get by spat because there's a lot of mortality at that stage but we're hoping to see that those seed oysters and the market oysters are, are trending nicely upwards um it's messy data it doesn't seem to be doing that and honestly i i'm not entirely sure why i'm trying to i'm trying we're trying to figure it out but i'm honestly i don't know I think it's being driven by a very few sites over in the western part of the bay that are doing well um, given that big error. But why they're declining so badly you know, for the spat and seed, yeah, that's a bit of a mystery. Sorry, I wish I could give you a better answer. I wish I had a crystal ball and could tell, but I just don't. <laughs> I think Candy so had a, a follow up. Yeah, I was going to say yeah. she has a follow up. Um, are you following each area to determine which areas are good or bad? We have those data and that's something, this is this is quite preliminary, This the, the, these data from, this is from our most recent tonging uh, effort and it was, it was a lot of information. So this is fairly hot off the press. So what I want to do now is go into those lime rock areas because that's where we're seeing the interesting stuff. The others are kind of not doing so well. Um, 
but to drill down into those lime rock areas and see whether and we suspect that this is the case that that there are certain part, certain areas uh, there are 10 sites across the bay plus three that uh, fwc put out with lime rock so we want to look at each of those and see if we can see what's going on the other unknown um is that we know that there's illegal harvesting going on so that could be part of the explanation as to why we're not seeing the increasing trends on the eastern part of the bay what's going on in the west a bit of a mystery but illegal harvest could be contributing to the depletion in some of those sites because everybody knows where the good sites are so um but like i said um yes we are planning on looking more closely at what's going on in those especially those lime rock sites so see if we can pick out some of the trends we also have environmental data that might help us interpret some of this but it doesn't exactly match up with exactly where the sites are so it's a little bit of you know interpretation We have a question from Pranda Few, and this was added when you were talking about the western side of the bay, uh, but it may be in reference to the bay as a whole. Uh, do we know what caused the severe reef degradation or how to prevent it in the future? There are a number of um, papers that addressed that, and, and they were sort of, <clears throat> they weren't terribly conclusive. What probably the general consensus is that what probably happened, it was a number of things that combined over time there were a series of bad droughts between 2003 and 2013 and when the salinity goes up um the marine predators move in like the the oyster drills especially they can they can really do a number on the on the oyster habitat on the oysters themselves so the marine predators moved in um under saline and high temperature conditions diseases become more virulent um the animals get physiologically stressed so high temperatures and drought are not a good combination for the oysters themselves. Um, there were uh, the reshelling probe. So oysters are strange little creatures in that when you harvest them, you are taking their habitat away. So there was a reshelling program, but um, that was stopped in 2011, I believe. Um, so when you take away material through harvest and through natural erosion, the traditional part of fisheries management has been to put that back through reshelling programs. There's a number of reasons why that's problematic now. One is that the market for oysters has changed um, over time. It used to be a canning industry or, you know, so the shell would stay in place. Now it's primarily a half shell market, so the, the shells go elsewhere. And so you don't have those giant mounds of shells anymore that used to be returned to the bay through a state-run program. So there was, there was a, the reshelling sort of declined. Then in 2010, the oil spill happened. Now the oil didn't get here and there's no record of any dispersants coming in. So, but there was potentially some increased harvesting. It's unclear how much. Um, you ask different people and look at different data sets and it gives you different answers, but that could have been a contributor. Um, certainly the number of licenses I think went up um, and then uh, after the fishery collapse um, the the harvest continued so it sort of just made everything worse so it was a number of different things um, that contributed some were natural some were human caused um, and then we ended up in the situation that we were in in 2020 where there's mm -hmm. essentially no reefs left which sounds dramatic but um, but that's kind of where they were. That was a long answer to a short question. But. And we are just barely over time, but there's one last question in the chat, and it may be a short one as well. Um, does water temperature have an effect? Yes. Um, as the temperatures go up, the animals become physiologically stressed. Um, and their metabolism increases, you know, so food has to compensate for the increased metabolism. It's probably actually from, from the data that we have, unless the temperatures get really extreme, it's, um, it's probably high salinity that causes more physiological stress than high temperature. Um, and also low temperatures, you know, these animals down here, unlike the ones in the Northeast, they can't take being, you know, they can't take the cold. 
they're wimpy southern oysters and they don't like uh, being frozen. So um, yes, temperature will always have an effect on, on an animal. Okay, I think that just about wraps up our question portion. Um, I just want to say thank you to Sandra and Devin for a really great talk. Um, we really do appreciate you giving us the time um, for these updates and we thank you for all the work that both of you are doing in the Bay with your teams. I just wanted to give a quick reminder that next month Sci Cafe is going to be on December 14th. It's a week earlier than we usually do because of the holidays, but we will have our very own Aner water quality researcher, Ethan Bork. He will be discussing how trends in meteorology and water quality have changed in the Apalachicola estuary over the past two decades and why these changes are important and the potential implications that these trends may have for the future of our system. And so with that, I wanna say thank you again, Sandra and Devin, and thank you all for tuning in.